Yeah, good day, students. Um, I understand that we have had a problem with um, the incidents that happened at our university where students were attacked, and I understand that uh, some of our students were affected. Um, the fourth years were were affected in these uh, unf unfortunate incidents. But uh, I hope that uh, we will find a way. That is why um, I need to insist on you guys um, um, accessing my YouTube channel in order to, to be able to catch up because it is clear that we may not always be in class. Okay, at the moment we're dealing, up, we're dealing with pleas. You know, we've got a plea, a 112 plea, and we've got a 115 plea, and also the 105 capital A plea. Now, let us now deal with this, um, uh, with the section 06, that what which provides the plea. So we will have, pay our attention to section 106 of the Criminal Procedure Act, right? Um, where we we talk of pleas which may be raised by the accused, right? Um, Section one of six provides that the accused may plead. Uh, uh, may plead that he is guilty of the offence charged or any offence which may be. Uh, 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 convicted on, on on the charge right that he is not guilty that's another that's another way of uh, pleading you can plead that you are not guilty um or you can plead that you are guilty with the offense of uh, of, of which you've been you've been arraigned for so well what is important is that uh, once you have been um arraigned for a, a, a for a crime and you plead guilty the the law says you should be convicted immediately you don't wait so if you are a presiding officer somebody comes to your court and pleads guilty immediately you need to convict and then sentence before because people might change their minds okay so we've got the plea of guilty and then there's a plea of not guilty, which means, like we did in class, that uh, further investigation must be in co conducted in order to prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, an accused can also plead that he has he has already been convicted of the of the offence which is uh, with, with he is charged. Um, uh, in America, there's something called double jeopardy. We do not use that principle of, job, of double jeopardy in South Africa. We don't plead double jeopardy. You can say it, but uh, it is not uh, accepted in our law. But it means the same thing. If you plead that I have already been convicted of the offense with which I am being charged, that is pleading double jeopardy. But we don't say double job but the least you can say is a latin word that says outre voice convict that means i have already been convicted for this uh, for the offense that i'm being charged is outre voice convict or hey, the accused can plead that he has already been acquitted of the offense with which he is being charged. That also is called outre voice acquit, acquit. All right, it's outre voice acquit. That now is, you are saying you've already been dis, uh, found not guilty of the offense that you are being charged. All right. Fifthly, this is now this is now four ways in. Uh, 
a person can uh, can plead in a court of law. The fifth one, there's about nine of them. The fifth one, that he has received a free pardon from the president from the offense charged. A person can also plead that he has already been um, pardoned by the president, so the person may not be charged. Sixthly, that the court has no jurisdiction to try the offense. Okay, that's another plea. You can you can you can say that this court has no jurisdiction. For instance, I once had a case where a person was threatened by the hawks to say um, he has um, failed to to deliver on on a, uh, a contract um, that he had with a certain government department and. The hawks were, were on top of him, and um, they were threatening to take his property to, and to put him in jail, and uh, he would not uh, get bail. And our plea was that this matter falls under the civil procedure, not the criminal procedure. So it's a matter of... Uh, uh, going through the civil route, which is uh, writing a um, letter of demand and issuing summons. So the court had no jurisdiction because of the area of law. So there could be other reasons uh, where you can plead that the court does not have jurisdiction, right? Or, or, or the seventh way of, uh, of uh, pleading will be that uh, that he has been discharged from prostitution in terms of section 204 after uh, a giving satisfactory evidence for the state right so section 204 is where you as an attorney um again you negotiate with the prosecutor with the senior public prosecutor to say because the case is complicated and you do not have enough evidence, my client will um, enter into an agreement where uh, he will not be prosecuted because he's going to be what is called the state witness. It's, it's sometimes they say is a section 204. So section 204 means a state witness. So that's another scenario where a person can plead uh, that uh, he should not be uh, uh, brought to trial for a case because he has made an agreement with the prosecutor to be a state witness in terms of Section 204. Okay, but it's important to know Section 204 and also important to know Section 205. But for the purposes of pleading. Uh, you do, we do not need 204. 204 is, uh, 205 is um, when um, uh, the, the investigating officer wants to prove the case, and, but now he wants to invade your, your client's privacy. What happens is he applies for uh, Section 205 from the magistrate to say they want to go and get information like information like your bank statement, uh, which is uh, confidential, or else go and get your, your conversations from your, from your phone. So they will, they will go to, uh, they will go to uh, a, 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 a MTN or Vodacom to go and get this information that indeed, uh, because you are suspected of having killed of having been a hitman that killed the, hus the husband of a certain uh, woman, then they will want to prove that there was conversation between you and the woman. The only way they can prove is by accessing your telephone records and uh, proving that there has been conversation, although they would not know the actual yeah, to add on section 204, what you need to understand is that um, 
a person will be uh, given a reprieve that uh, he, he would not be uh, prosecuted. But what normally happens is that uh, you, you, you enter into this agreement with the state and um, once you've entered, you will be given a, a suspended sentence on condition that if the evidence that you are going to give does not convict, then the sentence that you were given, which was suspended, will take effect and you, you will be uh, 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 committed to prison. So there are those conditions. It depends as to how how you will negotiate around Section 204. You might um, negotiate that your client be absolved of any of any wrongdoing in return for him giving evidence that will make sure that uh, uh, his accomplices are convicted. And if he changes his mind and he does not um, uh, follow what uh, he's been told or maybe thinks that uh, he is now scared to, 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 to come and uh, give evidence, then he will be the only one that is uh, brought to court and uh, convicted. So section, of, section four of 204 goes like that. And also, uh, an accused can plead that, um, that the prosecutor has no title to prosecute. We've had, we've had uh, this happening in Peter Marisberg. There was an ex-president that was uh, standing trial and he then pleaded that uh, the prosecutor has no title to prosecute and as it is now, he is busy uh, actually doing what? Um, uh, uh, laying charges against the same uh, prosecutor because that plea did not succeed. He said the prosecutor had no, had no title to prosecute because he had vested vested interest in the case of because he was once involved in some spy tapes and something like that. So he said he's got no title to prosecute. And um, well, I hope that uh, everybody understands what is meant by that the prosecutor has no has no title, right? Another scenario in which um, an accused person um, can plead, he might also plead that um, the prosecution may not be resumed or instituted owing to an order by a court under Section 342, Capital A, Subsection 3, Subsection C. Yeah, in those cases, it's where, as an attorney, you will make an application where you see that the matter has been postponed for, for numerous um, occasions. You'll find that, especially on the sixth month, on the sixth month as an attorney, you have a duty to make an application to the court that uh, the, uh, the case must be withdrawn. Sometimes some attorneys will say it must be provisionally withdrawn. There is nothing uh, such as provisional withdrawal. If a case is withdrawn, it is withdrawn. That is why uh, I do not advise people to say, may the case be provisionally withdrawn because it seems that um, the state doesn't have enough evidence to convict uh, my client and then you made that application. So I am against the, um, the notion of saying provisionally withdrawn. If you withdraw, you just withdraw. And if it's reinstated, you can raise, you can raise the sections that I've just given to you, which is section 342, uh, capital A, subsection 3, subsection C of the Criminal Procedure Act. You raise that and say, I am not going to allow, to allow my client to be arraigned, to be arraigned before any court. Um, uh, later on, I will explain to you what do we mean by arraigned. 
and also we will talk about um, the the situation where um, the accused uh, doesn't want to plead to a case. Yeah, so let us carry on. Okay, students, coming back to section 106 of the of the Criminal Procedure Act, um, the section goes further and provides that two or more pleas may be pleaded together, except for one plea. That is the plea of guilty. The plea of guilty it goes alone. You cannot plead it with another with another plea, right? Um, you cannot plead in the same in the same uh, charge. You can't say uh, pleading guilty and also pleading that this matter has um, uh, was was uh, previously dealt with or I have been convicted of the matter. You can't plead. You can't have those those two together. Right. So section one hundred and six, subsection four, provides that except for the plea that the court lacks jurisdiction or where the court enters a plea of not guilty on behalf of the accused. An accused who pleads to the charge shall be entitled to a conviction or an acquittal immediately. If he pleads not guilty and you can see that uh, there is no, you know, there's not enough evidence, you acquit that. If he pleads guilty, he must, like I've said, he must be sentenced immediately. Yes, like I've said, the plea of guilty, the person has to be, once a person pleads guilty, right, immediately that person has to be sentenced. You cannot delay and uh, you just, in fact, you, you don't sentence. Sentence might come later, but you have to convict. If a person pleads guilty and you are satisfied as a presiding officer that uh, he knows exactly what is meant by, by the plea of guilty and there is proof uh, by the state uh, through its, um, um, through its uh, uh, witnesses that the person has committed the offense, everything is, is before court, the gun is uh, registered in his name, uh, the person who, who has been killed is the wife and the witnesses are there in court uh, who saw him killing him then you can use you can uh, now that person has to be convicted now let's 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 have the difference between conviction and sentences those are two scenarios conviction is something else and sentencing is something else go and do your research and tell me what do we mean by conviction and what do we mean by a sentence right now what we you need to take into consideration is that there has been a change with the way things were done before our constitution of 1996 that is act 108 of 1996 before the coming into operation of the criminal procedure act of 1977 right uh, things were different um and I choose who pleaded guilty before the High Court or, or, or to any offense other than murder couldn't be convicted without any evidence being led, right? That was now a scenario before the coming into existence of uh, the Criminal Procedure Act of 1977. That now, that means in the years before 1977, if a person uh, pleaded guilty uh, in front of a, a, a judge uh, of the High Court to uh, to any offense other than murder, right? That person could be convicted without any evidence being led, right? As the judge generally had the preparatory examination record before him, he would be familiar with the circumstances of the case and in a position to pass sentence, right? 
A lower court, on the other hand, um, um, having no preparatory examination record, could generally only convict on accused who pleaded guilty where there was proof in the form of evidence. Like I've said, the gun is in front of court, the, the, uh, the, the, the guy is, is um, also admitting that this was my wife, this is my gun, and this firearm is um, registered under my name, and I am the one who used it. And there are no other fingerprints on the firearm. Uh, that plea remani, plea rema, preliminary examination or investigation has been done. So everything is before court, right? That the offense had been committed by this accused, though it was not necessary to show that it was the accused who had committed it. Um, the, 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 that provision was commonly known as the evidence aliunde right it was called the evidence aliunde rule right then um, when uh, the 1977 act which is the, the criminal procedure act came um then everything was replaced by section 12 section 112 112 which is um the section that abolished the distinction between proceeding before the higher and lower courts as well as the aluande rule those now were abolished so the the introduction of section 112 <coughs> Of, of the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 1977 actually abolished the decision between proceedings before the higher court and the lower courts, as well as what is what was then known as the Aluende, uh, Aluende, uh, Aluende rule. That those were abolished, right? Section 112, subsection 1 lays down two different processes where and choose to a summary trial in any court pleads guilty to the offense charged or to an offense of which he may be convicted to the charge and the procedure to accept such plea one for serious uh, offense and the other for a less serious offense so section 112 uh, provides as follows where an accused at a summary trial in any court pleads guilty to the offense charge to an offense which he may be convicted on the charge and the procedure accept that plea the presiding, presiding officer which could be the judge the regional court magistrate the magistrate at the lower court may if he is of the opinion that the offense does not merit punishment of imprisonment or any other form of, of detention without the option of a fine or a fine exceeding the amount determined by the minister which is normally uh, as, as from 2013 it was a fine not exceeding 5,000 rand right as it appears in the government gazette uh, r62 uh, gg36311 that accused may be uh, convicted in respect of the offense to which he or she has pleaded guilty on his or her plea of guilty right so it's simple straight, straightforward the person pleads guilty and the magistrate um, will will then convict right and can also impose any competent sentence other than imprisonment or any other form of detention without the option of a fine or a fine exceeding the amount of 5,000 rand as determined by the minister from time to time by notice in the Gazette. Or he may deal with the accused, otherwise in accordance with the law. The presiding judge, regional magistrate or magistrate shall, if he 
or she is of the opinion that uh, the offence merits punishment of imprisonment or any other form of, of detention without the option of a fine or a fine exceeding the amount of uh, 5,000 rands. He may then um, uh, opt for a situation where, where um, he would um, Uh, he would uh, uh, he would uh, convict the accused, right? And uh, but you, before you convict, you need to make sure that uh, the fine will exceed five thousand rand, right? And if requested there to by the prosecutor, you must you must question the uh, the accused with the reference to the alleged facts of the case in order to ascertain whether he or she admits the allegation in the charge to which he or she has pleaded guilty and may if satisfied that the accused is guilty of the offense to which he or she has pleaded guilty convict the accused on his plea of guilty of that offense and impose any competent sentence so that was the change that was brought by the Act, which is Act 51 of 1977, the Criminal Procedure Act, right? Even accused of um, or his legal advisor hands a written statement by the accused into court in which the accused sets out the facts which he admits and which he has pleaded guilty. The court may, in lieu of questioning the accused under Section 1B, as I've said, that you need to ascertain as a, as a is a magistrate that the accused is pleaded guilty, but does he understand what does it mean? And does he understand what are the, uh, and the implications? Was he promised anything before he pleaded guilty? Um, or was, uh, was he coerced, you know, or was there any inducement in, in any form that led him to, um, to plead as such, right? Then the, uh, the, the, the court may then convict the accused on the strength of such statement and sentencing as provided in, in, the, in the set uh, subsection. If the court is satisfied that the accused is guilty of the offense to which he has pleaded guilty, right? Provided that uh, the court may, in its discretion, put any question in the accused in order to clarify any matter raised in the statement, right? Nothing in the in the section which is 112 shall prevent the prosecutor from presenting evidence on any aspect or on behalf of the accused with uh, with regard to sentence uh, from uh, questioning the accused and any aspect of the case for the purpose of determining an appropriate sentence that is now you know when the person is uh, is about to be sentenced the, normally, the prosecutor will make a statement and maybe uh, stress that these kinds of crime are prevalent in our area. So the court must make sure that a hefty sentence is uh, put upon this actual so that it can deter or it can um, deter the would-be offenders or it, it, can, it, it can send a message. Those are the statements that the uh, the prosecutor is allowed under this section to do where somebody pleads guilty to an offence. You need to um, raise argument in favour of a harsher sentence. Normally, um, prosecutors don't ever um, uh, raise any argument in mitigation of sentence. The prosecutors are always acting on behalf of, of the state and the complainant. So I've never heard of a prosecutor who says, I am pleading for a lighter sentence. Prosecutors will always plead for a harsher sentence so that it sends a message to the committee that all those who think of uh, committing this uh, 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 offense should be deterred. So be careful when you are a prosecutor, do not plead leniency for the actions because people will think that you've been bought and you'll be in trouble.
So what is important in this instance is that the presiding officer should satisfy himself that the accused understand what he's pleading guilty to. For instance, an accused might plead that he is guilty of reckless driving. And uh, according to a case of, um, I think it's Adaba, 1992, uh, Volume 2, SSR 325, the Transvaal case, um, that was the issue, that the accused should know exactly what he is, what is pleading to, what what does a reckless driving mean? Because sometimes you could uh, park your, your car uh, at a certain area, and somebody drunk comes and bang on your car, and that person dies, and you are the only person surviving. You will be charged for reckless driving and couple of homicide. And then if you go to court and say, I plead guilty, I know I have, uh, you know, uh, because of, or because I parked where I parked, then I think I was reckless and somebody died, so I'm pleading guilty. So that is why uh, there must be an inquiry to find out of whether the person understands the meaning of uh, 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 reckless driving. Because sometimes um, people would think that uh, drinking and driving is a crime and I also know that you also think that drinking and driving is a crime but drink, drinking and driving is not a crime uh, another case that you can look at is the case of Morris the citation is 1992 uh, volume 1 uh, SACR I've told you SACR stands for South African Criminal Law Reports at page 537 it's an appeals court case where somebody just said, no, I know I was reckless, right? So I, uh, I deserve to be uh, punished. And on appeal, it was found that uh, actually the person did not understand what does it mean, what, what reckless driving means. And also another case of Gora. The person pleaded guilty because uh, he had been drinking. And when he was stopped by the police and arrested, because he was drinking, he pleaded guilty to the offense. And because he doesn't know uh, what is the alcohol limit in your, in, your, in your blood system or in your system or in your blood, because driving under the influence of liquor in South Africa is not a crime. But driving a motor vehicle where the alcohol, alcohol limit exceeds the regulation um, the, the, the regulation then that's only when you are guilty on of an offense otherwise drinking and driving is not an offense but if you are over the limit then that is a problem so you need to know what is the limit it's there and if you check your, your, your standards it will be there um, or you can even check your your, your, your iPhones your iPhones will tell you if you Google the, the limit, it will tell you. Um, if you exceed this limit, um, that is that will be an, an offense. Otherwise, drinking and driving in South Africa is not an offense. Okay. Now, on the other hand, it is very important to take note of uh, the Child Justice Act 75 of uh, 2008 when dealing with the, a, a, a minor accused. Right, that is now a child accused. So we know what we mean by a child. Any anybody who is uh, below the age of 18 is regarded as a, as a child. Right. Now, a statement tendered um, on behalf of a child must, in view of the uh, of a child offender's age and the criminal capacity, comply with sections 112, subsection 2 of the criminal of the uh, criminal procedure uh, of the act to certify the court of the child's guilt. Hence, uh, where a child offender is between 10 and 14 years of age, the court uh, prosecutor and defense counsel must be alive to the fact that the offender is rebuttably presumed to be criminal non-responsible because of the age. So if, if your, your offender is uh, between the ages of 10 and 14. That offender is pres presumed not to be liable. So if a child of 10 
kills kills your your wife um, he may not be um, held liable for that matter because he does not understand in terms of the law he does not understand what he, what he, what he was doing the burden of uh, reparting this presumption rests on the prosecution it is the work of the prosecution to prove that the child knew exactly what was um, what was happening and that uh, he knew that what he did was was a crime the prosecution would obviously have been uh, relieved uh, of that obligation had an appropriate admission been made by the accused in the statement in terms of section 112. But there is an important step that uh, the prosecution has, uh, has, uh, has to undertake in the proceeding, which is to ascertain whether the child's development was sufficient uh, to rebut the presumption of, of 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 innocence. Right. The statement must inform the, uh, the presiding officer about the child's state of mind at the time of committing the offence, or his uh, level of perception, then or, or whether he was a mature was mature enough to answer for his behaviour. From this uh, factual basis, the court then must be satisfied as to the guilt of the accused. A simple. Uh, uh, regurgitation of what uh, must have been the content of the, of the charge sheet in the statement does not uh, comply with uh, section 112 subsection 2. That was, that was the case in the case of Msheng versus the state. The citation is 2, uh, 2009, volume 2, SACR, at page 3, at 316. It's a, it's a Supreme, of, Supreme Court appeal case so you need to read that case and then you will you will you will, you will then know exactly whether um that presumption is correctly applied or not right so there are there are certain aspects in terms of uh, uh, this uh, this act that uh, it uh, regards must be taken uh, in in terms of uh, section 112 right First of all, they must be questioning by the presiding officer, and an uneducated, right, and an unrepresented accused may plead guilty to an offence, meaning no more than uh, that that he performed the act which is stabbing alleged in the charge sheet, which is an uh, that is an allegation in the, in the charge sheet. He must say no, I stabbed, so I'm guilty. But was there any ground of justification? Then it is for the prosecutor and the preside, presiding officer, or um, uh, in the line of questioning, where, where they need to establish whether this uneducated accused knows uh, what he what uh, what uh, he is pleading guilty to, right? And with the provision of the Criminal Procedure Act, uh, 1951, I mean uh, 51 of 1977, uh, for questioning an accused who pleads guilty, the, the danger of wrong conviction has been considerably diminished, right? This a procedure should be applied with caution. That is now when you are question, questioning the, the actual, so you need to do with question. Uh, if you want to um, get extensive knowledge on this issue, you can read the case of the Def Defender, uh, it's Fan Defender, 1978, a volume 3 uh, SA at page 97 it's a Transvaal court and also the case of Pigua also in 1978 volume 1 SA 397 so I hope you understand uh, when I give you citations because citation is this it will be the name of the case that the person who was uh, the accused or the appellant and then 1978 is the year uh, this judgment was made and then the volume. If you look at uh, uh, at the uh, law reports at the back or on the spine of the law reports, there will be a number two, three, four, five. That is called the volume. So, if you go to the library and you pull out uh, the the law report, you will look at the spine, 
after after a lot of it. It will it will there will be a year and then there'll be a volume. Then you take that. Then you know exactly that you are on the right track. You'll be able to to find the right uh, the right case and uh, uh, get the principle. You don't just read the whole case. You read the principle. Where do you get get the the, the principle? It will be on the reasoning of the presiding officer that I found this I find this person not guilty because of this that is the principle so you look at the principle even on the summary on top you will you will get the the the, 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 the legal question or the principle when you when reading a case reading the whole case and reading the story it does not help you if you if you write my my exams and you tell me the story or you just uh, narrate the story you don't go to the legal question and the principle then you won't, you won't get any marks so be careful when you're citing it you cite a case and what is the legal principle right so you need to understand that okay now let's come to a situation where we um, uh, we have to draft the the, 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 the plea, uh, plea bargain agreement in terms of section 105 because that is exactly what we were dealing with. Um, what is important for us to know here is that um, when you are asked to, to draft the, uh, the plea in terms of section 105A subsection 1 of the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 1977 is amended. This is what you know. You will start with the seat of the court. And for instance, if we're in Mpangin, we'll say um, in the magistrate court for the district of Kichwayo held in Mpangi. Right? That is the seat of the court. And then just below on your on your right, just below on your right, right, um, you write the case number. And uh, after that, and then you will write the state versus, you just write the state, and then send versus, you, then you put the name of the actuals and say the state versus shop, eh? and then on the right hand side, you write um, actuals. And then, and then the next step will be for you to draw a line. Okay, you just draw a lateral line. Uh, how do you draw a line? This is how you draw a line. You you go to your you are on word, so you go to um, uh, to underline this. You'll see that there is there is B I U U with a small line under it. B stands for um, uh, when you are highlighting, right? And then I stands for the italics. If you if, if for instance if you are Quoting a case, you must use italics. Or if you are, yes, you are quoting a principle from the case, you must write in, in italics to show that what you are saying was said by someone else. So you say, Judge uh, so and so um, said in a case of so and so, the, the, the legal principle was, and then in italics you write that. But now let's come to making a line. So you will, you will click on the U right and then once the u is shaded then you will go to uh, the left of your of your laptop on the, on the left of it you will see uh, something written tab right All right your tab and then what you will do you will then uh, uh, click on the space where you want to draw a line that is now you click on it and you click on it and uh, and then uh, press we do a hard press on tab you will see then the line will form and then underneath the line you write in capital letters highlighted that is now with the, it must be dark okay you highlight it um, yeah, and then you write agreement in terms of section 105a uh, in brackets one of the criminal procedure act 51 of 1977 and then in bracket to say as amended okay because it is, like i've said it was amended and um, the scenario that was before this act 
um, is now different right okay and then you and then you draw another line you use the same method you 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 just click on the space where you want to draw the second line because that agreement in terms of section 14 must be between two lines so it's going to be between two lines and then uh, what you do next you will draw the line you'll use the same procedure you click on the just underneath at the beginning of the of your if your way you will be writing your sentence you just click there and then you press your hard press tab and you will see a line going through that's how you draw a line underneath then after that you, you then you you remove the underline because if you if you leave that underline shaded whatever you're writing is is going to have a line and underneath and that is wrong even the agreement in terms of section 105a which, which you've just written on top you, you it, it must not have a line underneath how do you remove that line you you then unshade the u for underline right you unshade it and then you will just write and then again when you're drawing the line you will then you will then uh, shade it and uh, click underneath and press tab continuously the line will be drawn automatically okay and then when it comes to then after you finish that then you start by a because it is important when you are writing um your 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 plea okay in terms of section 105a um you need to have what is called paragraphs so you will number paragraphs so you, at first you'll say a a is a preamble you write the preamble in capital letters and then in the middle i i, I always like my students to write paragraphs in the middle of your paper and then in the middle of your paper you will you will write just underneath the preamble you will write one and then you start by saying um whereas i have been informed right that i have a right to and then because the paragraph is one then you will say you will say enter you will put a a, 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 a hyphen that is the two the two dots after two whereas i have been informed that i have a right to and then you put the dotted lines that is the hyphen and then you say okay on the side now because you've got this paragraph but now we need to do a sub paragraph how do you do a sub paragraph you you, you do a, para, a sub paragraph by writing 1.1 1. 1. that's a sub sub paragraph by point I mean 1.1 1. 1. and then you continue right uh, I have a right to 1.1 1. 1. be presume presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt comma and then you 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 you, you, you do enter and then it will be 1.2 that's another right that you have to remain silent and not testify during the proceedings and then you write end 1.3 not to be compelled to give self incriminating evidence that is now paragraph that is now paragraph one okay that is paragraph one um yeah then we are done with uh, paragraph one and then we come to paragraph two right paragraph two you'll, you'll start and then you write paragraph two in the middle because you've had paragraph one with all the sub paragraphs then you come to paragraph two paragraph two you will start by saying um whereas i've been informed that the state has consulted with the police uh, with that is that the police official charged with the investigation in this case so you write that whereas i've been informed that the state has consulted with the police official charged with the investigation in this case that is paragraph two then you come to paragraph three paragraph three in the middle middle of the sentence right paragraph three whereas my legal representative has consulted with the senior public prosecutor right and then you come to paragraph four 
paragraph 4, you say, whereas the senior public prosecutor has been duly authorized by the National Director of Public Prosecution to enter into this agreement, right? And then um, you continue, you continue um, by saying, um, so you, uh, paragraph 3, whereas my legal representative have consulted with the senior public prosecutor, then you continue to uh, paragraph 4. Remember to always write your paragraphs in the middle of the of the paper, right? And then you'll say, whereas the senior public prosecutor has been duly authorized by National Director of Public Prosecution to enter into this agreement, right? And then you come to paragraph 5. Must have paragraph. Each, whatever you say must be under a paragraph. Right, whereas, that is now paragraph five, whereas the prosecutor has consulted with the person charged with the investigation in this case and the provisions of section 105A, subsection one, subsection B of the act, that is now 51 of 1977, right? Paragraph six, whereas the state, the state has consulted with complainant in this matter. Right, and then you go to uh, paragraph seven. Whereas I have been informed that this agreement cannot bind the presiding officer not to exercise his or her discretion or perform his or her duties according to the relevant law. That is now paragraph seven. Um, and then you will say also uh, where uh, uh, paragraph eight. Now. Therefore, in this agreement, I set out the terms of the agreement, comma, the substantial facts of the matter and all other facts relevant to the agreed sentence, as well as some admissions made by myself, which admissions are made freely, voluntarily, while I am of sound and sober senses. Right? And then we come to B and then you will have after after uh, uh, paragraph eight, then because your 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 your, your uh, A was was now what the preamble, but now you were giving all the introductions. This is all what what you've done, which is very important. That uh, you have consulted with the with the I O, you have consulted with the prosecutor, and you you dispense the fact that. Uh, you are not, um, you are not, um, uh, so, um, so, like I've said, um, you, we've said um, uh, um, uh, the first part, right, part A will be the preamble. So, we've got the preamble, we have, we have, we have stated in our statement, which is our affidavit, that uh, all the stakeholders, have been consulted, including the complainant. The complainant is, is the victim. In this case, uh, this, the, the example that I'm, 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 I'm working on is where somebody was assaulted. So we will go to the victim and say, this is the situation. In most cases, the, the victim will not allow to be plea bargain because plea bargain is um, it's annoying. There was a plea bargain that was made in America recently um, where a black judge uh, pardoned, not pardoned as such, accepted a plea bargain from a white policeman. And you can imagine it's a black judge, the victim was black, he was murdered, and the attorney um, uh, negotiated for a plea bargain, and there was chaos, there was pandemonium such a, in such a way that the, the judge had to be evacuated. Because the mother of the of the victim, the deceased, um, uh, just uh, went berserk and destroyed everything in the court. Just threw away the the, the, the laptops, the computers, and tore down all the the, the courts, everything. So the court was then adjourned abruptly, you know, under those circumstances and. Uh, 
the court orderly because they were police they were expecting it i, I suppose but normally in a court there's only one court orderly but in this case there were uh, quite many so they try to restrain the the relatives of the deceased and so that is why so you have to consult but they do not agree they normally do not agree but whether they agree or not the plea bargain unfortunately will go on and it, it will it will succeed unless you have failed to show in your in your affidavit that you have consulted all these people and also say that the presiding officer is not restrained to exercise his discretion just because there's this agreement. Okay, now, and then we come to, after paragraph 8, it will be part B. Part B will be the actual plea agreement. Then you will have B, and then you will write plea agreement. And then, um, and then you underneath you will state before you make a, before you make a, any paragraph. You then say plea agreement, and then you just say how is this plea agreement uh, uh, been structured. So at the state, uh, my legal representative and I have agreed that I be charged with the offence of assault with the with the intention to do. Uh, grievous bodily harm okay here this was the case the, the actual case was attempted murder so be careful once you come to the plea agreement you must change the charge you you can't say it was murder and i'm i'm, I'm i am going to be we agree that i'm going to be charged with murder so what would be the plea agreement for you are uh, uh, entering into a plea agreement because you want a lesser charge for you, for your for your client in in return of him not in having wasted the the court's time. Because what is important about the the, the plea agreement, it's uh, some kind of mediation. It's some kind of making sure that there is no lengthy uh, trial where you will have to call seven witnesses to come and waste the court's time. Is it going to be speedy and justice will be served immediately? Okay, so instead of attempted murder, and then we, we agree on a case of assault with intention to do grievous point. You can, if you are a good negotiator, uh, better than myself, you can even uh, negotiate for common assault, from attempted murder to common assault. You can, uh, you can also, um, um, you can also uh, negotiate for assault and yet the case was murder. Okay, now... Just after that, it says statement in terms of section 105A, subsection 1, subsection A, right? And then um, you say, and then you say paragraph 1 again. Now, this is paragraph 1 for, uh, for or part B, which is the plea agreement itself. And then, then paragraph 1 will say, I uh, Senzo Madala confirmed that I plead guilty to the charge of, uh, of assault with intention to cause grievous bodily harm. That is paragraph one. Okay, paragraph two. The facts on which I plead guilty are as follows. It is important, uh, students, to know that when you plead guilty, you must plead guilty to all the elements of the crime. It's either, it's either you say them you say, because we, 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 we described um, uh, we described assault GBH as unlawful and intentional causing of grievous bodily harm to another, right? That is uh, that is now the, the, the all the elements. So the elements are unlawful, intentional causing of grievous bodily harm to another. Okay, because you must you must be you must you must state that it's a human being that is being assaulted. Because if you assault an animal, and uh, you cause grievous bodily harm, it that is not a crime. It it is a crime. It, it will be a crime, but it won't be assault GBH. It will be maybe a malicious injury to property because an animal is, is is a property. So that is the difference. So you need to make that distinction between an animal and a human. Being. And you must it even in murder you can't say 
uh, unlawful and intentional uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of anything. You must say of a human being. Yeah. Right, so um, you need to make that, dis that distinction that it is a human being that we're talking about. Murder will be unlawful and intentional killing of a human being. If you don't say killing of a human being, then you must know that elements of that crime are short. So you cannot charge a person for that. All right. And then, um, um, so the elements of the crime are very important. If you don't, uh, if you don't state all the elements of the crime, uh, you you are not the charge will be wrong and the person can apply uh, for the charges to be quashed. That is also very important. We'll talk about that uh, later on, right? So you are saying the facts of which I plead guilty are as follows. And then, because this is now paragraph 2, so you'll say now 2.1, 2.1, and you, you write 2.1 on the side, on your left, where you start the sentence. It will be 2.1. On the day in question in December 2018, we had been consuming alcohol with my wife and son at a party which was hosted by our relatives. When we returned home, an argument ensued between me and my son. That's paragraph 2.1. And then you continue, you're just narrating the story, the background, how did it come to, to the, the assault, right? 2.2.1, right? No, no, 2.2. .2. Okay, 2.2, .2, you say, I then picked up a brick and tried to assault my son. The brick struck my wife on, on her head and she sustained serious injuries. Uh, I had foreseen that my wife, who was trying to intervene in the argument, could be hit, but I nevertheless carried on with the attack and hit her. Right, so there, there is now what is called dollars, dollars, Eventually, dollars directors is where you take a brick and you want to hit your son and you hit your son. Dollars eventually is you, you, you pick a brick, you hit, um, uh, you throw the brick, you know that there is a wife standing in between you and the son, but you, you but nevertheless you carry on throwing the brick and you foresee that there's a possibility that your wife can be hit. That is now dollars eventually, right? And you may be on or you can, in your brackets, you can put, you, you, like you say, I, 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 I had foreseen that my wife, who was trying to intervene in the argument, could be hit. But I never, uh, nevertheless carried on with the attack and hit her. Then you can put in brackets, dollars eventually, okay, in brackets, right? Paragraph three, you write paragraph three now in the middle, because we are done with paragraph two. We've got paragraph 2.1 and 2.2. All right, paragraph three in the middle, I admit the following, that uh, 3.1 on the left, my actions were unlawful and punishable by law. 3.2, I failed to exercise restraint when it was clear to me that the complainant could be injured in the, in the attack. Right. Right. Paragraph 3.3, uh, I had intentions to assault the complainant causing grievous bodily harm and that the, she sustained injuries due to my actions. 3.4, I have no defense in the law for my actions, right? Then we are done with paragraph 4. And now you say, now, therefore, in, in, in you write that in, in, in uh, not in both letters, in capital letters. Now, therefore, I am guilty of assault with intention to do, uh, 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 to cause uh, grievous bodily harm. And then you see, now we come to part C, which is now the sentence, right? The sentence is as follows. Um, the sentence agreement in terms of section 105B subsection, that is now subsection, okay, subsection uh, 105, subsection B, uh, uh, and uh, Roman figure 2, right? It is recorded that the state and the representative of the accused have had extensive negotiations and uh, discussions with regard to the charge against the actuals and have considered the following factors. And now we come to the factors. Personal circumstances. 1.1. I am 
61 years of age, currently married and have children. I permanently reside at at uh, Sundumbili area in in uh, in in, in Mandeni with my family. I am a pensioner and support my family with social grant. I am the sole supporter and also responsible for the medical expenses of my family. Right. Uh, another point, which is 1.5, I was diagnosed with chronic diabetes mellitus. Uh, 1.6, I have cooperated with the police at the time of my arrest. 1.7, I have no pending charges and no previous conviction, and this is my first brush with the law. 1.8, my highest standard of education is standard one. Right? Further factors considered uh, in reaching the sentence agreement. The potential length and expense of trial of this nature, given the multiplicity of documentation and the volume of evidence which would, would have to be led, um, the cost of such a trial for both the state and the accused, the accused cooperation during the investigation, the nature of the offense, the remorse uh, of the accused, um, 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 the occurrence and prevalence of this type of crime in the area, the interest of society in, in an appropriate sentence, the objects of sentence, in particular the element uh, of deterrence individual as well as general. The accused has not failed to respect bail conditions. So the accused is, is uh, you mentioned that. Um, <coughs> um, yes, now we are dealing with the sentence. It is very important that uh, um, uh, now when you're dealing with the sentence, the sentence right now will be part D. The accused has not uh, failed to respect the bail conditions, right? That, mean, that means the accused um, respected all the bail conditions, so the, there will be no need for him to be to be, uh, to be uh, chastised or punished. Or there's nothing that shows that uh, the accused is uh, is a delinquent. Okay, now let's come to part D. Right, we've had part A, part B, part C, part D. Now we come to part D. You must have part D. And then now, this is now the agreed sentence. Right, and then you start by saying, it is recorded that the state and the representative of the accused have agreed in terms of section 105A of the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 97 that an appropriate sentence would be the following. Right, that the accused be sentenced to a term of imprisonment of three years wholly suspended for a period of three years on condition that the accused is not again convicted of assault with the intention to cause previous bodily harm, which offense is committed during the period of suspension. And then that is that is the sentence. And then on, then the, on the next line, in capital letters, you will write dated and signed at Mandini on this um, uh, 17th day of March 2023 and then you will have the accused or this the one that has to sign and then the legal representative will sign the senior public prosecutor will sign this is an agreement right after that then there will be something called annex C annex C is very important if I give you this exercise mm. in an examination and you leave out annex C you will lose a lot of marks because annex C is very important because it it uh, shows that the investigating officer was involved in these negotiations. Now you and then you start you say right annex C underneath you write statement by the investigating officer. Uh, this is how it, it will start. It must also be uh, 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 with paragraphs. So paragraph one will you say I. Uh, uh, inspector or citizen or, or bracadia so and so here by certify as follows right uh, um, uh, sex, I mean, uh, paragraph one I am the investigating officer in this case number you state the, the case number which is the state versus you you you, you put the name of the accused cars number right is now cars number S S A P S cars number and case number are two different things. 
CAS number CAS will be the, 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 the crime register at the police station, okay? And then the, the case number is the case number at the, um, at, at, in court. So these numbers are not the same. The case number will be say, case number 157 uh, of two of three, uh, 2023. That will be the cast number. The case number will be um, case number 20 of 2023. That's the difference. We, the case number in court doesn't have a month. The case number, uh, the cars number at the police station has both the, uh, the, the police case number, that is now the, the crime register number, uh, the month and the year. The case it now is now the role of the, of the cases in court, right? There are cases at the police station. Say the police have, um, uh, have registered so many cases in this month so they will they will go chronological from one to three right and then in court also there will be cases that the court has on the roll including this case so the the, the numbers the those uh, numbers won't be the same the cast number is not going to be the same as the case number so you must you must carefully make that distinction right and then uh, paragraph two uh, uh, mr uh, Mr. Mjuli, where the prosecutor handling the case uh, has discussed the contents of the plea and sentence agreement as, as the following aspect. The nature of the circumstances relating to the offense, the personal circumstances of the accused, but B, C, the previous conviction of the accused, A, and D, the interest of the community. Remarks by the investigating officer. Then the the uh, the, the investigator can ha can can do remarks or can say I have no remarks, right? But you must write there. And the remarks maybe you could say the um, accused was cooperative. The accused um, uh, did not resist arrest, and he has not he has not interfered with the um, with the investigation. And that's and then it has to be signed. It's also signed at Sundumbili on this. Uh, 17th day of March 2023 that is the end and then at the end the investigating officer must sign so you will draw a line and after you've drawn like after, how I've told you to draw a line it will be a short line this time and then under that line you write investigating officer then on top of the line the investigating officer must do what the investigating officer must sign that is how you must do the this is how you this is how you are asked to do the plea bargain in terms of section 105a if there's anything you don't understand tell your class rep then i will answer that question and give it to you so that you can everybody can benefit please ask questions there are a lot of ways that you don't understand there are a lot of concepts that you don't understand the other day I asked one of, of you of you guys in the class as to what is the meaning of ex parte. You must if you say ex parte painting or ex parte uh, 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 book, you must know what is the meaning of ex parte. I've noticed that you don't know what the meaning of it. And uh, anything that you don't understand, if you come across a word and you don't understand it, please raise your finger and tell me to clarify that word. If you don't know it, Go to Google. Google will tell you the meaning. Everything is there. It's just that we are just lazy to use your fingers. Lift your finger. Go to Google and find out what is the meaning of experte, right? And go to Google and and, and find out what is the mean, meaning of BCA, BCLR, BCLR. You will find it there. You go to yes, from from Google. So use your fingers. It's important. Otherwise, I will think that you know and yet you don't know. Thank you very much. I hope this makes sense to you. Uh, we, are, we are going through a hard time. Please tell your other friends to, to go to my, uh, to my YouTube channel and subscribe. Even if you don't, if, if, if you haven't subscribed, but go to my YouTube channel, The African Dignity, and uh, look at what I've posted. 
so that we don't lose time. Today we're supposed to have a class and we did not. So I am making amends that you don't lose a thing. Good luck. Please do listen carefully. Rewind and listen. Rewind and listen. Put your, your specs and rewind and listen. Thank you.